Welcome everyone. Just give us a couple of minutes um, to welcome everyone into the room and we'll get started shortly. I'm definitely like singing multiple songs in my head. Okay, but are they, what 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 decade are the songs from? Because I'm here in seventies in my head right now. You know, you mentioned Beyonce to me earlier. I'm still on that like blackest king Beyonce wave right now. Is Beyonce in the Gap Band and Earth, Wind, and Fire always? I'm hearing some Curtis Mayfield in my head. <laughs> Valerie, what about you? Oh goodness, I wasn't even thinking about it. It wouldn't be Beyonce. Um, all right, you have to give me a minute. I have to think about that for a minute. Okay? All right, so I am going to get started. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Know Your Black History, Tracing the African Diaspora's Flavors and Techniques, a special event in honor of Black History Month. I'm Melanja Hastic, Central Coordinator of Impact and Finance, and I'm so happy to be welcoming you all this evening. Since last March, the James Beard Foundation has been hosting virtual events and industry support webinars to help navigate the challenges of COVID-19, provide resources for the hospitality industry, and to stay better connected throughout difficult times. But before I introduce tonight's panelists, here are some quick housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded. We'll post a link to the recording on openforgood.com after the program wraps. If you have any questions for the panelists, please write them using the webinar toolbar and we'll address a few questions as time allows. If you're having any diff technical difficulties, just message us using the webinar toolbar and we'll do what we can to troubleshoot. My colleague Debbie will be keeping an eye out and we'll be happy to assist, okay? So on to our panelists. Tonight's moderator is Cassandra Rosario, who is a pioneer for marginalized voices in the dining scene. She created the Food Before Love Guide in 2012 to combat stereotypes that people of color face with regards to fine dining, restaurants, or issues surrounding food. Cassandra is a food educator and was one of the first bloggers to address the disparity in dining culture. Next, we have Eric Williams. Eric Williams is a chef and owner of Virtue Restaurant and Bar in Chicago, his first solo concept, which opened in 2018. A Chicago native, Chef Eric has a passion for history and art as they relate to fine dining and a love of Southern cuisine and barbecue. He was featured, he was a featured speaker at the 2019 Philly Chef Conference and was named a Smith Symposium Fellow in 2019 by the Southern Foodways Alliance. Next, we have Jackie Summers. Jackie Summers is an acclaimed author, seasoned public speaker, and a serial entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Summers is the founder of Jack from Brooklyn, Inc. and the creator of the award-winning Sorel Liqueur. A native New Yorker, he was ranked among the world's 100 most influential bar industry figures by Drinks International Magazine in 2019 and 2020. He was also named to the Imbibe 75 in 2021, the 50 most influential people in Brooklyn food, a part of Brooklyn Magazine in 2015, and named 2019 award winner for best food essay by the Association of Food Journalists. Next up, we have Valerie Irwin, who is a longtime Philadelphia chef who for 12 years until 2014 owned the critically acclaimed Geechee Girl Rice Cafe. Valerie specializes in the food of the low country, the coast of S South Carolina and Georgia, where her grandparents were born. Throughout her career, she has also served as general manager of Eat Cafe, a West Philadelphia neighborhood restaurant with an innovative pay what you can model manager of Farm to Families, a produce access of St. Christopher's Foundation for Children. As a board member of the Southern Foodways Alliance, CCAP, 
and the Philadelphia Interfaith Hospitality Network, and as an advocate for rights for undocumented restaurant workers and food industry employees. And next up, we have Julia Coney. Julia is a Washington DC and Houston um, Texas-based wine, wine writer, educator, speaker, and consultant. Her writing includes stories on wine, winemakers, and the intersection of race, wine, and language. She holds a WSET Level 2 certification in wine and spirits and is currently pursuing her master level champagne certification with the Wine Scholar Guide Guild and WSET Level 3 certification. Julia is the recipient of Wine Enthusiast 2020 Social Visionary Award winner, the founder of Black Wine Professionals, a contributing editor for Vine Pair, and a 2019 fellow of the Professional Wine Writers Symposium at Meadowood Napa Valley. Now, thank you all so much. Cassandra, you can take it from here. Awesome. I hope y'all all feeling good today, everybody that's watching, everybody that's here. Thank you, Melandra, for the introductions. And obviously, welcome, Valerie, Julia, Eric, and Jackie. I'm so happy to be here with you guys tonight, as well as all of you guys that are watching us from afar. Um, when I set my intention for this conversation, I knew that I really wanted it to be focused around joy. Um, we're going to talk about education, but I just want to talk about, I want it to be about Black joy. You know it's Black History Month. Y'all came with a party, so I just want that to be the set intention for this for this combo. Um, so, as someone that's deeply interested in food, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge how the current model, whether it be you know in the beverage industry, fine dining, what's available in your neighborhood, isn't always the most like accessible or equitable space, right? And you can't think about food justice without thinking about justice for farmers. And I thought it was important to mention that because this conversation is about knowing your roots. And to do that, we have to go back to the agriculture. Um, so I want to open the conversation about talking about the foods themselves and the techniques around them. I typically open any conversation that I have in the hospitality space um, with a food memory. I love talking about food memories, going back to like, you know, what made you smile, something in your childhood that's like so nostalgic for you that you still think about. Um, and I'd like to touch on it today as it relates to food waste. So for me, I grew up in a Puerto Rican household, right? So eating like mofongo in my house is something that is rooted in Africa for me. You know, just the, the technique of mashing the plantain and, you know, as it relates to fufu and um, the Angolans, a lot of Angolans were um, in the slave trade transferred over to Puerto Rico dating back to the 1500s. And obviously Fufu also does go back even to West Africa. Um, but that for me is what really comes to mind. Uh, but I wanna start the conversation with you, Valerie, if you could touch on um, some of the foods that are true to us as a people, to your Gullah Geechee culture, I'd love for you to share a memory that sticks out to you. And I'd like everyone to share after that. So Valerie, if you could kick us off. Um. So there are there are a few things, um, and the interesting thing for me is a lot of the, a lot of the really iconic low country dishes were things that I learned to make at home, but I didn't necessarily like them when we had them. So the two big ones for, for me were um, gumbo, and um, you know I I, I want to slap everybody who says gumbo is only in New Orleans, and because it's like you know. We got a million people, you know, 10,000 people on, in the low country that, you know, will fight you on that. So we, you know, so I grew up eating um, um, gumbo, sometimes with meat, but a lot of times it was just okra and corn and tomatoes. And those are both things I served in my restaurant. And the other one is um, Hoppin' John, uh, which is uh, black eyed peas and rice. And my mother would make hop and John. So really, my father was the cook of my family, but there were certain things that my mother made. So my mother made hop and John um, on New Year's Day. I ne she never made it any other time. She and she would uh, cook it with um, a hog jowl. So when you open the pot, there was actually a pig's jaw in it. And at, at the time, it was just beyond off-putting. And now I'm like kind of impressed. So um, 
you we so we made Hoff and John every day at my restaurant and I still make it and my sister you know many I have four there's five of us and many of us weren't that all that crazy about beans when we were growing up but now we all love that dish and uh one of the things that I I did. My father, if we had leftover beans and rice, he would fry he would fry fat back and then fry the rice and beans in the fat back. And so we I used to do that with the hop and john. And I would, you know, have the regular sort of fluffy peel off kind. But after a while I discovered nobody wanted that. Everybody wanted the fried one. So that was my like um, you know, uh, uh, you know, a really like uh cow peas and and rice like you know straight from west africa to the low country to philadelphia and um you know so now that i have lots of people who love that awesome thank you for sharing julia let's move on to you what about you food memory that stands out to you it could be a beverage memory as well well, for me, um, I grew up between Houston and Louisiana, so I understood, and we traveled a lot with just going through the South, so I understood like what Valerie was saying. Gumbo is just very different in a lot of places, but I just remember a lot of those flavors, but also barbecue and the like Tex-Mex are really, really big in the South where I'm from. And for me, my first really understanding of wine was paired with Texas brisket and ribs. And it was really these luxurious Napa Valley Cabernets where I really understood where food and wine go together because my family doesn't drink. And so that memory still stands where I connected the wine and the, the simple meal and potato salad. I mean, everything you think as a barbecue is just somebody is having this amazing wine. So for me, that memory stands out. And I wasn't working in wine. I didn't think I would ever be in wine. But that profound memory of having a brisket sandwich and ribs and potato salad with the Napa Valley Cabernet in the late 90s still sticks with me to this day. And Julio, uh, one thing I learned about you too, like in a lot of your interviews, a lot of your food pairings are like foods that I can relate to. Like you had mentioned like one of your favorite pairings was like with crawfish and Touffet. And I was just like floored, like these are things that I recognize. And you know, you talking about collaborating it with wine just takes it to the next level. So thank you for that. Um, Eric, let's, let's go on to you. Repeat the question, please. So I was just asking about a food memory of yours as it relates to the food ways. So we just want to talk about some of the foods that um, we recognize, you know, from our cultures um, that date back for you. Um, so just sharing a food memory that does that for you. I think the memory that um, stands out the most is the smell of cornbread walking in the house on a warm day. I mean, on a cold day, actually. Um, and biscuits happen to be one of my fondest memories. It's like the hardest recipe to get from the past. Um, there are current versions of biscuits, uh, but when you get into the biscuits that our grandparents made, our great grandparents made, um, because of the limited amount of access we had to um, uh, reading and writing many years ago, um, many of us share the same story of how recipes weren't passed down in writing. They were all oral. And it was it was something about the way that my grandparents and my great-grandparents worked dough um, that's still very difficult and challenging to, to harness in the same exact way. And my grandmother, when I would talk to her about making biscuits, uh, would just kind of chuckle and say, baby, I have a trained hand. And so Hearing hearing those stories and having those memories around breads, obviously I, I could list off a hundred uh, recipes of things that that are near and dear to me. But but I think the fondest memory would probably be um, the breads that we ate that that directly were influenced by Southern living. Awesome, Jackie. And Jackie, um, when you share your your food memory, I also want you to end about talking about sorrow so we can learn more about your story. Okay, but I just want to say when the cooker doesn't think again, we're going to Julia's house because you notice she didn't say ribs. Ribs was a uh, was a two syllable word for her, so you know it's <laughs> eating, eating ribs, eating ribs. You know it's real. So my my food memory, I'm Caribbean on both sides, 
Uh, my father's parents came from uh, Nevis and St. Kitts, and my mother's parents came from Barbados, and they both landed in Harlem, New York, exactly 100 years ago. But I first became aware of my food culture on Eastern Parkway on, on Labor Day weekend when they do the Caribbean Day Parade, when there's literally two million coconuts in the middle of the street. And like there was dancing and there's floats and there's people and all these feather costumes, but I wanted to eat like the food was amazing. And I remember as a kid, maybe five years old, tasting curry goat and jerk chicken for the first time in my life. And I was like, why have you kept this from me? This is my stuff. And since you wanted to end with that, how I get to, how I get to Sorel, I remember having my first taste of non-alcoholic sorrel on, on the street on Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn too many people out thinking to myself, I don't know what that red stuff is, but I like it and I want it for the rest of my life. I love that. All right, so let's get deeper into this conversation about sorrow. Um, and and Jackie, you really have such an inspiring story. And for those guys that don't know, Jackie is like the first black man that has a license to you know have a liquor license and to be able to make it in America. So can you talk to us about, you know, what your story is and what led you to wanting to make sorrow in the first place? Like you said, you tried it and you were like, I need to have this forever. So where did you make that switch? Because you have a media background as well. So I had 25 years in corporate America, but 10 years ago I had a cancer scare. My doctor found a tumor the size of a golf ball inside my spine and said, you're probably going to die. And if you live, you're probably going to be paralyzed. You should organize your paperwork. I lived, but it will adjust your perspective. Given the new outlook, I thought to myself, what do I really want to do with my life? And cast the thing I wanted to do more than anything else in the world was day drink. I want to be around cool people in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, talking about stuff that matters. I want to be eating good food and having good drink, and I wanted to monetize it. And when I couldn't think of who would pay me to do that, I said, I'm going to launch a liquor brand. And I'm going to take something from my culture and make that be my thing. Uh, to be clear, I didn't know that other Black people weren't doing this. I didn't have any idea. But like, I wasn't trying to, I, was, I don't think any of us are trying to be firsts when this happens. You know, like, my mom was a research scientist in the 50s doing some of the first studies on the effects of cigarette smoke on, in, in, in lab animals. And that was a time when they weren't hiring black people or women. But she wasn't trying to break ground. She's trying to eat. She's trying to feed kids. So like, you know, to, 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 the, to the passive labor force and make our lives easier today. Yeah, and, and I you touched on a good point because I think it's also when you think about food and some of the things that are made out of it, um, I just think about how a lot of what we eat today is was made out of survival. Yes. Right. Um, I don't know if Valerie wants to touch on this and, and some of the dishes that we can relate to, or even Eric with some of the things that you serve at your restaurant. Um, but just thinking about the history of some of the foods that, you know, have kind of transitioned. Some of the foods that we used to eat you know, quote unquote, back in the day have transitioned now. Um, and Eric, you can speak to this as well as far as like how your menu goes and how you guys have kind of changed, you know, the presentation of some of these foods, but while still keeping like the flavors at the center um, and the core of what, you know, the feeling that you want people to get at the center of, of your work. Um, so I tend to spend a good amount of time <clears throat> um, reimagining um, what what we wanted ingredients to be and and what we wanted the outcome to feel like. So one of those things would be chicken gizzards. Chicken gizzards um, are one of those things that I that I saw growing up. Uh, my mother ate them often and truthfully, I couldn't eat them. It was just too darn chewy. Um, and so so one of the first things I took on when we thought about doing virtue, is recreating um, um, gizzards that were tender. And we have to cook them longer. 
and then we flash fry them. So it so upon looking at them, um, you know, it it looks like a regular fried chicken gizzard, but once you bite into them, it tastes like a dark meat chicken nugget. Um, and so that that was me thinking about how I could make something a little bit more accessible. Um, I think when we when we think about um, you know, maybe a, a couple of generations behind us, it was not uncommon to have at least one person in your home, if you were African American, that had dentures. And we simply identified those as false teeth. And so um, so food had to be tender. It needed to have less chew um, um, for, for um, older family members to fully enjoy and ingest that food because you know they weren't working with you know the same set that they were working with in their 20s and 30s or maybe in their 40s um but as it relates to food that is historical and food that was that was presented by way of survival i think when we look at all the food um that that served across the world it was all served by way of survival it was it was divided between the kings and the and the peasants, as we would call them, um, or the 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 um, the owners of the plantations and the slaves. However, um, I think what what often gets lost in the conversation about food and the history of food is this ideal that African Americans and predominantly African American women fed the entire country, either by their hands or through their breasts. And so when we start there, then there's no limit to what we were cooking by way of that food of survival. We not only cook the food that was in the fields that we understand as soul food and the food that we understand as the best of scrap cooking, but we also cook the better parts of those animals and the better parts of those vegetables in the houses. We were the cooks, the chefs, the keepers, and the processors of food in this country. And to some degree, we still are. And so, um, I, you know, presentation, I think, is important. Many of us eat with our eyes. But I also think just as important is the understanding of the value of the food that we're preparing. And not just, um, uh, you know, the, the quick context or the quick narrative. Um, I think I think another thing that kind of gets lost, and I won't venture too far off, uh, but it stays in context in terms of history. Over the years, we've gotten a bad rap as it relates to soul food and as it relates to black cookery, because we have more access to protein than we ever had in any other time in history. And we have more access to fried foods than we ever have in any other time in history. Even in my own adult life, I can remember back to being a kid, and the only time I ever saw a steak was after payday. It just didn't even exist before payday. So, and, and you, and it was most likely a raise. So, you know, if a steak was around, it was probably on a Saturday, and someone had gotten paid that Friday, and likely had gotten a promotion. Those other days were filled with rump roast, short ribs. Um, um, catfish was only on a Friday. Fried chicken was one day a week, one day a week only. There was no Popeyes where, and, and nobody had enough money to go to Popeyes four times in a week or fight over a chicken sandwich. Like it just wasn't a thing. And so um, I think historically we we have something that that not only uh, was captured by us, but needs to be rekindled. Looks like Jackie's got something to say. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Jackie, did you want to add on there? I'm, I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw a couple things out there real quick. Uh, the first thing is, just follow up what Eric, what Eric said. Not only were we making the food, we made the drinks. To be clear, the people who weren't cooking their own food, they weren't tending their own bar, they weren't working their own stills. That was us. We made the alcohol. We served the cocktails. All of dive bar culture, all of cocktail culture comes from what Black people were doing. But just to go back to that, the, the, the food, 
like my two favorite dishes that are clearly poverty food and survival food are jerk chicken and oxtail. The story of jerk chicken is amazing because you have to go back to Jamaica and you've got uh, es escaped enslaved Africans who had fled to the mountains of Jamaica and hooked up with indigenous people who hadn't been slaughtered. And they needed to stay on the move from the British so they wouldn't get caught. So they took spices that they had brought over from, from the, again, from the slave trade. And they took cooking techniques that the indigenous people had used. And they had to figure out how to cook the food, A, without making a flame and give away their position, and B, in a way that it would preserve the food so they could stay moving. So jerk chicken is entirely a survival food because you weren't trying to get your ass caught by the British again. Closer to home for me would be oxtail. Uh, a, a, again, this is the stuff that butchers would throw away. My, my grandmother would feed a family of six on a dollar a day. My, my grandfather was a chef. Uh, but my, you know he'd come home after working in a in a a, a rail car box in a, a a rail car kitchen for after twelve hours and say Nita what for dinner, and she would have rice and peas and oxtail stew, and then a dollar she could feed a family. And like, for me, like those throwaway foods aren't just what we survived and it's what we thrived on. Yeah. So I, I'm going to try to answer this, but my internet connection is really weird. I'm going to switch to another computer. But um, the one that I think about is um, neck bones and tomatoes, which was my my father's favorite dish. And I remember what just recently in the newspaper, somebody said something like, can you get pork neck in Philadelphia? And my answer was, try a browner neighborhood. So, so um, and I made, this was for a, a dinner I did with Anson Mills, and I made um, neck bones and tomatoes. And my big concession was I actually stripped the meat off the bones, but in our house, you would have had a pile of bones on, on your plate. And the, the first time when I was working in restaurants, the first time I had asobuco, it was like, I mean, it's good and all, but it tastes just like neck bones and tomatoes to me. And it's like, I didn't, I couldn't figure out like how how, how was that thing such a like sort of um high class dish whereas the things that we made were not even recognized it, it wasn't the flavor i'll tell you that so so that's that's the one i think about um all the time and and i have to say i'm very much um you know i Basically, I've been in a restaurant kitchens for my entire adult life, but I'm very much a home cook and I am pretty much against the idea of elevating home home cooking because I feel like it's already on a pedestal and you don't have to elevate it. You, you know, you can change the presentation, you can mix up how you make it. I mean, you know, it's like you can be creative, but but I, but not with the idea that you're making something um, better than was made for the last 200 years. That I don't have that feeling. All right. So, excuse me while I try a, a different computer. Okay. No worries. So All while right. Valerie is doing that, I actually um, want to read a quote um, from Eric's Restaurant Virtues website that I thought was so powerful and so important for this conversation. Um, it reads, we didn't get here of ourselves or by ourselves. We stand on the shoulders of our ancestry, both distant and near. The ones who, give, who gave birth to who we are and what we become. Without their struggles, their commitment to freedom, and their spirit of hope, we would have no place to dream, no place to explore, and no ambitions to follow. And we are humbled and forever grateful for their tireless fight for equality. Wow. Um, this is so powerful, Eric. And um, this is open question for anyone who wants to take it. But what, may, what this made me think about is how can we continue to honor this legacy through our work? You know, how do we personally do so? How do we encourage others to do the same? I'm going to start with Julian. wine. I'm going. I'm really okay. going to start because Eric just Eric made me hungry. Valerie made me hungry. Jackie's making me hungry. And I think about 
wine pairings. When we think of wine pairings, it usually comes from this Eurocentric way of food. Have no problem with that. Don't have a problem with that. But when I think of wine, because I'm from the South, I'm going, is it crawfish season? I grew up having shrimp and grits like breakfast. So when I see shrimp and grits on the menu, I'm always like, y'all charging $30 for that? Like, that's just, that's ridiculous. Because in my mind, that's just something you eat because they're trying to clean out the refrigerator on Saturday. And that's all you get. They, they cleaning it out and they throw in a little bit of greens, a little bit of herbs, and that's your dish, right? So for me, when I think of food and you were saying, you know, Puerto Rican food, mofongo, and all these like jerk chicken, I am always thinking like what wine pairs with these amazing dishes because they're not just dishes of my culture, but friends' culture and friends who have become family being adult and traveling. So when Chef Eric said about chicken gizzards, I'm like, oh, Blanc de Blanc Champagne, because in Louisiana, you buy your chicken gizzards at a gas station. Like, that's where you go. You driving, there's a gas station, somebody's serving some chicken gizzards. I'm always thinking like, I'm bringing some champagne. And so I'm bringing these elevated wines to something that's people, as Valerie saying, is we've been making it. And we're not getting this elevation of this dish. But to me, I want to present wine in a way to make people feel comfortable with their food. It, it's the reason why I, I enjoy, you know, wine with chips, snacks, Fritos, from Lay's to Ruffles, to all the kind of snacks we like, cheeses. I can have a wine to pair with that because I want people to really enjoy wine. And also because we have this rich history of food and we have all these flavors and different seasonings that and spices. It's never been presented before, right? But why hasn't it been? Because at that, like, we also have to think white wine hasn't been in our culture. Wine is usually not on a lot of black tables, Caribbean tables, because a lot of religious regions, right? A lot of my family doesn't drink. I'm the one that drinks. I come home and I'm the one with all the wine and everybody's laughing like she has her wine. She brought her glasses and she's having this. But I want people to really feel comfortable thinking their food goes with this wine because it's been such a disconnect. So that's why I'm always talking about cultural food and food of like, I just want to enjoy great food with great people because at the end of the day, wine is an experience just as food. And they always are presented very separately. And I'm trying to figure out how to really work on merging those together to let people, all the cultural foods, as we say, or the, I hate this word, quote unquote, ethnic, so that I'm putting it in quotes. It's not ethnic food. It's just food that this culture has. Because if you go to, if you go to a different culture, they don't have that food. That, and so your food is ethnic at that moment, but we don't present it that way. And so I just want, like, I just want Chef Eric to make me some chicken gizzards and I want to bring some some baller bottles and we have it together and I want Valerie to make her uh oxtails so and have some wine with it because I want people to experience this cuisine because the history of this is so amazing and we just I just want to my dream is to merge the two that when you think it doesn't mean fine dining I don't mean that term I mean good food good wine good people that's it awesome. for a second. Yes, of course. Um, Julia, nicely done. Um, whenever you want to have chicken gizzards and champagne, you let me know. Um, I'm available. We can we can sit six feet apart until they allow us to sit closer together. Um, so I think I think um, Julia brought up some some interesting things about spirits. Um, and again, I won't take us off, but but I just want to unpack this a little bit. America is the only country that does not have wine at every dinner table. And, you know, minus a few folks who just don't drink. And you can't drink until you're a certain age. Almost everyone else, um, um, teenagers are having a glass of wine. They're not getting drunk. They're having a glass of wine with their family. Um, and we manage more alcoholics in this country than everybody else does. But you got to wait until you're 21 to, to drink. When we think historically um, about wine and think about who were the controllers of that wine, um, being France, and you know later you know Napa 
started doing what it was doing. Um, it shares the same parallel with cheese. Um, wine obviously goes very, very well with cheese. But when you think about Southern food, you don't think so much about cheese because cheese is a long aging process in most cases when you want really great cheese. And people just didn't have, you know, that much time to be storing milk. It just didn't. And so, um, so you, other than pimento cheese, um, you don't see a whole lot of rich cheese dishes coming out of the South until we start to get into macaroni and cheese. Um, I 100% agree with you, Julia. There needs to be more wine drinking in the world. I think we'd all be a lot calmer and we would manage some things a lot better. The ABV, alcohol levels on wine are a lot less than, than many spirits. And I won't take anything away from Jackie because at the end of the day, he's right. You know, some, some slave somewhere yeah. was, was looking at sugar or, or the, 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 the process, I mean, the over-processed parts of sugar fermenting and said to themselves, you know what, we should taste this. And they were on their way to making rum. But like, historically, rum is made from what was a throwaway product. That's what and I said. The After the sugar it process. Away. Yes. They were throwing it away. That whole, that whole industry owes everything to people that looks like us, everything. And, and even in this country, thank God for foreign we've been putting the story of Uncle Nearest out. Now we know a black man taught Jack Dennis how to make whiskey. You know, people will tell you that George Washington had a, you know, had a distillery. George Washington was not working the still. He had enslaved Africans for that. That was us. And they also taught him how to make macaroni and cheese. And there's history in that in Virginia and that information on all these, you know, things that they say was at, you know, Monticello actually came from a slave who was actually the chef at Monticello. All of it. All of it. So my my thing that I want to just to go back to the original original question, Cass, and I'll be quick. My thing that I want to see that will help the next generation move forward. I want to see more of us own things. We have had our culture monetized, our labor monetized our ideas monetized for centuries and been cut out of it. I, this is, this, I, I, every, time I, every time I talk to a group like this, I, I say the question, if you go back 200 years, 1820, 99% of black people in this country were working for a white person. How many are still working for a white person? So I want to see us own things. If you don't own it, it owns you. We need to figure out how we can open up paths to ownership, whether it's food, whether it's restaurants, whether it's wine brands, whether it's liquor brands. This is what you come from. This is your history. This is your culture. Own it. Awesome. Um, I just want to quickly bring Valerie up to speed. Um, we were just talking about how are we honoring, um, you know, this legacy through our work. And you know, everyone was just touching on you know what it means to them and how they personally do so. So that's where the conversation opened up from. Um, you can speak on it if you like. You mean like going forward? More so in the present time, like how are we like currently do our work? Um, you know, it's. I spend a lot of time, you know, working with different organizations doing different things in social justice. And one of the just like really discouraging challenges is the the fact that that uh, black people in particular are are kind of are behind in things like, you know, wealth and business ownership is the result of um of a systemic apartheid, and that's what, and it's hard to overcome a system one person at a time. And so a lot of times it's like you know, well, you know, I I can open something, someone can open something, but I really I want to think about more about how do we how do we get the system that oppressed us to be the system to to 
repair that damage? And I don't have the answer. I don't, you know, I I don't ha I don't have the answer, but um, I, I would I really would like to see some repair from that system. That being said, the only other th the other thing that I think that we can do is think more collectively. I that that you know someone that I actually follow on Instagram was talking about. Uh, that idea that of the nuclear family, everybody living in a different house, is like so American, and it, it's not even all that European. I mean, it's kind of northern European, but that idea that you, you have this small unit that's going to do everything, I think, really works against us. And so, I think we have to think more collectively, and maybe you can start with your whole family and not just your nuclear family or you know or your neighborhood or your town or your city or even something like this where it's like people doing similar things to the things that you that you're doing that um so we're not working alone it's just you know it's a big system to fight you you got to have a hard time fighting it by yourself so absolutely well, um, one thing that you mentioned was like this idea of like speaking in collective and community. And I think, you know, just the, the pandemic itself has shown us like what mutual aid can do, right? And just looking at like people having the right to to eat, you know, to get to get three meals a day. I think that's been like very relevant right now in the times that we're in and just this idea of mutual aid and this collectiveness sharing resources with one another um, is so important. Um, but just going back to my question about honoring legacy, um, just because nobody touched on this, but you guys are all here making Black history every day. So I wanted to talk about like how you guys are doing this through your work in present day, because you guys are making Black history every day, honoring your legacy, honest, honoring your ancestors every day. And, and I commend each of you for that. Um, as Valerie mentioned, you know, we're in a in an industry that tr traditionally can be a very alienating, his, um, has a history of being very alienating um, to marginalized communities like ours. So I also want to talk, um, and this question is for Julia, just about what transforming that looks like. And I, I want to mention um, Black wine professionals here as well that you developed. If you can just speak to um, what Black wine professionals is and, and why you created it and how it's kind of answering that call to bridge that gap, because as Valerie said, you know, one person at a time is is going to take a while. But I think that Black Wine Professionals does a great job of like attempting to bridge that gap and starting that conversation. Well, for me, um, I am here as a wine journalist because there is a Black woman who wrote for the Wall Street Journal for decades named Dorothy Gator. I am not here without her. She was the first Black person I saw as a columnist in wine as a consumer. So I'm talking 1998. They wrote, her and her husband wrote that column for 12 years. And for me, when I think of my work with Black wine professionals, I spent two years after really speaking up about the racism in the wine industry from 2008, I spent two years traveling the world on all the media trips. That's how the word gets out about wine. They pay, they bring journalists over to a country, they wine and dine you for 10 days or seven days, five days, wherever you want, and they just throw everything at you. I was the one few black, one of the few black people on the trip. And I kept realizing like, I couldn't drink late because I had to be on the bus on time. I couldn't show up not looking like I slept in my clothes, you know, just it's alcohol. So we have to be honest about what ha happens with alcohol and all that. And I, and for two years, I realized like I was the only person getting invited. It may have been one other person, but we're talking trips that took place 10 to 15 times a month for years. And when I realized, and I started, when I started Black Wine Professionals, it was in response to Black Eyed Tuesday, George Floyd's murder, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. And a, one person reached out to me. She's like, I don't know that many Black people in wine that are professionals. And that's when I decided I was going to start a listserv, a database, so people get a check. Like, let's be clear. I'm not literally starting a database so you could just like, oh, let me send you some free wine. Free wine is great. It's really great. Zeros and checks are better. 
because people need to feed their family. So I'm not really, I didn't create a database because I like, these are people who have been working in the industry even longer than me and I wanted them to shine. I wanted people to put a spotlight on them. And so we've had amazing brands to partner, literally provide education, provide jobs, provide classes. So my legacy is service to these people in this industry I love. It's never about me, it's always about we and how do I uplift them and get them to be so when the world opens up and somebody says they want to take, you know, they got they have 10 slots to take somebody to Burgundy. Well, I know two people who want to go to Burgundy. You want to go to Provence? I got a Provence person. You want to go to Italy? I got two Italy people. Let's work and get them that exposure because I realized they weren't even traveling. They had never been out of the country and working as wine directors, wine buyers, had never traveled to these regions. They're selling wine. But the same people kept going. And why is that? So that's what Black Wine Professionals is about, is to say, you can't tell me anymore you don't know any Black wine professionals because when you tell me you need a marketing person, oh, I have I have 10 people on the list. Here you go. Pick one. You don't know what to do with your social? Got another person over here. And that's what we provide. We provide an access. So, and also we negotiate rates for people because let's be clear, a lot of Black people, including myself, we lowball our price. We lowball what people should pay us. And I'm always negotiating and raising that and talking to people that not even look like me, what would be the rate for this? So I know when that person is being reached out to, here's what you should charge. Because we don't get that access. Mm -hmm. So can I throw this out there? Julie, the next yeah. time you're in Italy, like, I want a ticket. I'm down for that. I'm here for that. <laughs> but I got to, you. I think we all are. <laughs> right? We got to have a good time. But to speak to your to speak to your question, Cass, uh, there's an article that, that's gonna fall in the next couple of days. But I refer to myself as quote an unruly Negro, and here's why: it is not unusual for all these people who are firsts to get invited into conversations and to get seats at tables where you're the only one, and mm -hmm. the only purpose in being at that table is to open up seats for more people that look like you. You don't want to, I mean, Kamala said this when, when she took the oath, the point is not to be the first, the point is not to be the last. So they invite someone like me in, and the second I get there, my point is, well, who else can I get up in this piece? For real. And then COVID, for all of the damage it did, did all of us a favor. Because when COVID hit everyone, the first thing people said when all the restaurants shut down was, how do we get back to normal? Why would I help you get back to normal where I was <laughs> Like, I was never welcome in your normal. There's no reason for me to help reconstruct a system that was designed to exclude me. All those tables are overturned. It's a good time right now to figure out how we can set up our own tables. And we can build them however we like and be inclusive from the ground up instead of trying to fix a system that was designed to disclude us. Absolutely. Um, so I want to I want to open the floor up for questions that people have. Um, if you guys watching, you can put in the question box any questions that you might have that I will ask the group now. Um, so one of the questions that came up was. How can the Beard Foundation um, best support the preservation of this legacy of food legacy and also support the repair? I can jump in here. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the many ways that the James Beard Foundation can work towards preservation is first recognizing um, foods that represent specific cultures as equal. Um, I, I think I'm a firm believer and an advocate um, in the fact that, you know, Valerie brought this up, even though she did admit that she picked the meat off those um, neck bones um, and said she didn't want to make food more progressive. Uh, but either way, um, I'm just teasing Valerie. Um, That's okay. I'm not sensitive. All right. But it's all said and done. Uh, what what makes Asabuco um, a, a finer cut? or a finer technique. It's braised meat, right? And, and, it's an, and it's an off cut. What makes it finer than a neck bone? 
Um, now we're starting to see chefs cook pork collars when, when black folks have been cooking pork neck bones since the beginning of time. And, and Jackie's not joking when he talks about someone being able to feed a family with a dollar. Obviously prices are different now. Many of us can remember when flank steak was cheap and now all of a sudden it's expensive. Oxtails are almost as expensive as steaks are. But, mm -hmm. but the question is, as we re rediscover and rejigger pricing, why aren't we rejiggering how we identify technique, culture, and how we approach cookery as it relates to every region? We have to stop treating French food like it is the foundation of cooking as if France discovered fire or invented fire. It's, it's just not a reality. Yeah. I want to add to that because I know the James Beard House, you guys, they do dinners and they have psalms. And I always say sometimes you can you can bring people in who can tell a story, but they may always can't pour the perfect glass. And I say that because for years, every oh, in wine, and I'm talking specifically wine, it has been a psalm focused based. The psalm is the person and they know this and they can, you know, blind this and do that. I don't work in restaurants, but I can sell Jesus to God. So if you put me at a dinner and you want me to sell your dish with the wine, I can do that. Now, I may not do the perfect pour. I mean, my foil may be off. The cut may be off. But if you tell me, hey, we're going to have, as Valerie said, a, a, an exploration of gumbo. Let that be a dinner. An exploration of chick like gumbo, chicken gizzards, chicken, beef, liver. We have this and we pair this with wine. Let somebody tell the story that actually isn't there. Like, just let them tell the story because I have great, I'm, I'm, I'm pumping black wine professionals. I have great storytellers and black wine professionals. Some of them, don't, they've never worked on a restaurant floor. They don't know how to budget a wine, but they can tell you a story and sell you on the experience of that wine with that dish that represents us, but they will have not gotten that opportunity because they don't know how to work in a restaurant. They're not there to pour. Let them just tell the story and, and bring those stories together on the history of this dish and the flavors and components where we, re we relate to that. And other people want to relate as well. It's not just about us trying to show it. People are just curious. And since we have this curiosity time, let's figure out how to bring that to the masses. So people so can just see like we have all this exploration of food and culture and taste and profiles and is not based just on what something says, someone says over here. Yes. Um, so the one last thing time I want to say is um, the, what, what a lot of people don't realize about doing a meal at the Jane's Beard House is the restaurant bears all of the costs for that. So, you know, they pay for their staff. I mean, I think that the, the Beard House buys the food, but with, but at the Beard House and with a lot of events, you know, you, you, your big recompense is they put your name up and and then everything and everything else is cold hard cash. That, you know, even successful restaurants usually don't have all that much cash that they can, you know, to go do an event. When you start working with minority owned restaurants, they have fewer assets. And it's like, you know, if you want, if you want more, if you want a more diverse, um, you know, like a uh, platform, throw some money at them. I mean, it's, it's, it, that, that's like, a, that is a really easy way to level that playing field. And to back up what Valerie said, I'll be real quick, Cass. Okay. <laughs> the Beard House is a gatekeeper. And if you are a gay people who has actually come to terms with your complicity with white supremacy, your job is to figure out how to deconstruct the gates. Yeah. So I'm going to ask another question. And, and I just also want to piggyback off what Julia said. I think it's also about reimagining these opportunities and what the opportunities can look like. And I think, you know, 
sadly the pandemic it took the pandemic for us to really rethink like how we structure a lot of things but i think it's just a great opportunity to just reimagine what these opportunities are like she said someone can pour someone can do the storytelling so i think it's about that as well um we got a great question that i actually wanted to to ask but i didn't have the chance to so i'm glad someone in the audience made this question they asked if someone can discuss the connection between food and drinks as an aid to health and bringing it back to roots, uh, you know, with just having, you know, drinks and food that have medicinal properties. Okay, can I do this? Yeah. So they first started to bring hibiscus flowers over from West Africa in the 1600s, and it's got all these amazing medicinal properties. It's an, it's an antimicrobial, it's an antioxidant, it's an aphrodisiac. It's got more vitamin C than most citrus fruit which is important if you're crossing the ocean and don't want to catch scurvy. They would make this tea and British naval officers would put some rum in the tea to preserve it. And that is how sorrel became a thing in the Caribbean. So it is important to know that, and I bet you Eric can back this up, all these foods that came from our homes and all these foods that came from, whether it's Africa or how the they'd mix with the indigenous people, they'd, they'd mix with the Africans and South Africans, these were things that not just survived us, we thrived because we understood and, and on an agricultural level what it took to make those things happen, make them to make those things healthy. Like Sorel is good for you. It's got just enough alcohol so that I can make a living. But at the end of the day, like that it's actually good for you. Roots and vegetables and herbs and spices. We understand those things because that was our medicine before medicine was. Awesome. Did anyone else want to touch on any other foods that have medicinal I, properties that stick out to them? Well, I want to talk about wine in a way. When when wine, when we think of wine, I think we have to also think, like Eric said, wine is not on the table in a lot of our homes. Wine goes with food and it's a communal product. At the end of the day, it's an experience that is meant to be shared with food. When we present wine to, in my opinion, Black people, Caribbean people, people of color, is never presented with food. It is drink this, don't drink that, drink this, drink this. But when we, if we presented it with our culture, we will understand how many people have a Sunday dinner or they try, they want to when the world opens up. These two hour, very long dinners, very long meals that we, we see family. If you think about what happens after a church service in most cultures, that's when wine, if you go to Italy, wine is at the table all the time, but it's definitely on Sunday because everybody's having these three and four hour lunches in these experiences. If we show wine as an experience instead of wine as a product, that is the problem. We don't really show a case, but once again, it goes back to we're not showing our food with this wine. So then how is it an experience? Mm. And once we bring it back to community, communal product, community, which is wine, which is any beverage, and we having it together in enjoyment with people, I think for our culture, it will be very beneficial. You don't have to have a lot of it. You don't have to have any of it. But if we see it on the table, instead of let me go to college, and then I go to college, and because I didn't have wine, let me just lose my mind or any alcoholic product. And then we don't really, it's a disconnect. So we really bring it back to community, which I think it really is, we bring it back to community. I think we'll have it in not looking at it in a health term, because at the end of the day, it's still alcohol. At the end of the day, it's still alcohol. But if we bring it with community, the enjoyment and benefit, because you would drink a whole lot less. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in and I'll make this really brief. Um, <clears throat> actually, I'll, I'll tell a little bit of a story. Um, so some months ago, I received a batch of rice. We only used Carolina gold rice. Um, Carolina gold rice different from what we would see in something like Uncle Ben's still has the hull on it. And that shell that's on the rice, which hasn't been stripped, causes the rice to look grayer. It causes the rice to cook longer. It has more nutrients and it's chewier. So the rice actually has texture. Common day rice, as we know it, um, takes 20 minutes to cook. Don't remove the lid, 
add a lot of butter, salt, pepper. Your rice tastes like butter, salt, pepper. It does not taste like rice. And so um, this particular batch of rice that I got, the, the um, farmer called and says, hey, we're really, really sorry. If you need to send that back, send it back. But we didn't want to send you nothing. Or you can throw it away or, or whatever. And I said, well, what's wrong with the rice? And he says, well, there's, there's weed seed in the rice. And so I went to quickly open the rice and there were these like black specks mixed in with the rice. And so I cooked the rice. Once you cook the rice, you can't see the black specks anymore. So I called him back and I said, I'm not understanding. Did you overcharge me because you can't accurately weigh the rice as a result of this weed seed? He says, no, you can have the rice, but we know it's not your quality. It's not the spec that we generally send you. And I said, well, tell me, how did the weed seed get in there? He said, it's a heavy weed season. And, you know, the winds came in, blew an excessive amount of weed seed into our rice. We don't strip our rice. So it's all filtered in. I said, did our ancestors eat weed seed? He says, absolutely. But chefs don't want to see it. And you're a chef. And so I got off the phone and I cooked this rice. And I tasted it. I held it. I tasted some more of it the next day. And then I had an aha moment. I said, shit, we've been marketed to again. So every year, a friend of mine, not one of my friends, tells me about this whole idea of how we're going into our worst allergen season ever. Every year, the allergen seasons get worse. Part of what triggers allergies is the fact that we eat food that is stripped of everything that would lift our immunities to allergens. And then what do we have to do? Either we go out and we buy medicine or we go eat things like raw honey that have allergens naturally in them. And then your body responds to that honey. Well, the rice used to allow us to respond to allergens. But if we keep stripping everything, we've got pasteurized honey, pasteurized eggs, pasteurized rice. Every damn thing we eat has been stripped because we want food faster and we want food simpler and we don't want our teeth to work. I've got a healthy 32 in my mouth and everything I eat tastes like it came, like it's a McDonald's burger. It's soft. It's baby food. And so until we start to think about food in its natural state, we're going to continue to have these ailments that we have and need to spend more money on medicine and need to make more money. One of the reasons our ancestors were able to feed with a dollar is because they were healthier and they were eating foods that had nutrients. Lastly, I'll say, why is wine important? Women are told to eat a lot of yogurt for, for health reasons. I don't need to spell it out. Anybody can go online and figure out why women eat yogurt. Guys are told we should eat um, uh, we should drink things like um, kombucha because naturally it's fermented and it helps our stomachs and helps um, 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 how we process and digest food. Wine is fermented. I, I don't have to say anything else. Fermentation of product, of vegetation, helps our ingestion. So if someone missed the mark and thought that wine was only for full-on consumption, for full-on engagement when you want to be social and to possibly get drunk, you miss the bus. A glass of wine is actually healthier. The Heart uh, Association keeps telling us you should drink a glass of wine. And so that would be my conclusion as it relates to wine and food. Awesome. We are over time. I The conversation is like getting good now. I don't want to end it. So uh -huh. I have two questions that I'm going to take um before we close out and um one of them is specifically for valerie um we had a few requests if you could break down um just Gullah Geechee culture and cuisine for us so um all right so i have to my, my first disclaimer is i really grew up in philadelphia and i've had more um connection with the low country in the last like uh 10 years that i had all the time in in my life except for the food. So um, Geechee's and uh, so Gaul and Geechee are kind of uh, cousin um, ethnic groups and food with food ways and language. They are the descendants of enslaved Africans who live on the coast of the islands of South Carolina and Georgia, really from um, Southern North Carolina to Northern, Northern Florida. 
And um, they, especially the people who lived on the islands, the Africans were often left there because Europeans um, just couldn't did, couldn't tolerate being on on these uh, uh, trop subtropical sea islands. So because of that, there were many more Africans than Europeans, and they were able to keep a lot of African culture. So um, some language, you know, even the, like a word like gumbo is is um, um, from Central Africa and um, or okra. So they were able to keep um, some language. They have uh, there's a Creole that that was that spoken um, in that area, and they were able to keep a lot of foodways because they were not outnumbered by by Europeans. So you know, so yeah, so there's a lot of seafood because obviously they were on islands. Um, and then you know there are things that I, I think of as like the the uh, pan southern thing. So you know, like things like grits or uh, you know pork products. Um, but rice was the stable the, um, staple grain of that area um, right up until the time when they uh, lost their free labor force. And then for some reason nobody wanted to grow rice anymore. But in my family we grew up eating rice um, every day. We had rice for dinner every day, and um, and I I kind of thought it was normal, but so so those are the big things, you know, uh, rice and, and seafood and okra are kind of like little things. And there are other things, but those are little things. Okay, awesome. Um, so I actually I want to close out with this because we started the conversation talking about just farming and getting back to the land. And we had a question come in about just vegetarian cuisine, being black and being vegan, and kind of what those cooking techniques are for, you know, making lentils, rice, and grains. And I think rice is sometimes also the very forgotten piece of the conversation when like we all eat rice. <laughs> um, but just wanted to touch on um, just like vegetarian cuisine, veganism as it relates to food and drinking, um, if that resonates with you guys at all as far as our history and just kind of going back. I, I just I want to start with, oh. I was going to say, I once had someone come to my restaurant and say, like, I maybe I've been open five years, and he said, you know, I never came here before because I, I'm a vegetarian and I figured there would be nothing for me to eat. And I said, you know, um, where this cuisine comes from, they have a 10 month growing season. You know, vegetables are what people ate. If they if they had meat, if they had fish, um, it was something to make the vegetables take a little, taste a little better. And so, um, you know, I just think like cooking from the land is this country has like the the idea that um, having meat shows that you are prosperous. So it ha it has an outsized reputation, and uh, you know I think vegetables are really wonderful. We just have to think about them being a really valuable part of the diet, and not like a consolation prize. So, I mean, I don't have anything other than that. There's there's a ton of vegetable recipes. I'm not so much uh, on fake any proteins. It's like if you want to eat vegetarian, try cooking some vegetables and see what you like. <laughs> Julia, I know you wanted to add. I just want to add because I know we're in a movement of vegan wines, healthier wines. We have this concept of, you know, that I want to also tell people wine is an agricultural product. And when you're thinking about wine, you know, when I, I personally believe a wine cannot be vegan. I know that's a labeling term. If you ever been in a vineyard, there are fruit flies and bees. Things happen that just naturally happens with fermentation. Sometimes things are filtered with animal products without, but the whole labeling of terms is really hard in America. And it's really, a lot of people just jump on the bandwagon. I would tell people, if your wine costs less than the produce that you buy, like your avocado and apple, maybe you need to rethink that that's not the wine for you to buy. 
because I mean, the cork should cost a couple, few more dollars than what people are paying for. I will say if you do a little research, you can find very well-made wines. I don't mean the word natural. I mean, wines that people have been tending to the land. They they don't can't afford to pay the label of organic because it costs a lot of money in this country. But there are a lot of people who are black making great wines. There are a lot of people who are non-black making great wines. I will say, do your due diligence and find people who are making great wines, taking care of the land, also taking care of their workers who pick the grapes. Because a lot of times we forget that the majority of people picking grapes are people of color, primarily Hispanic people. We forget that when we want to save on our wine because we don't want to pay the $25 because the $5.99 looks a lot better. I will say you vote with your food dollars and you vote with your wine dollars. So don't forget that part of your, you know, locally sourced meal and you forget that your wine needs to be just as purposeful in its you know in its glass to you but there are really a, a lot of great people making great wine but also lose the labels on wine do your due diligence find really small go to a wine store sometime when you go to the grocery store these big you know stores they they're just shipping you they're just telling a turnover Find somebody that you actually, and go in being honest, like you may not know, you or you do know, and you're trying to experience things, and also try different things. Don't get complacent, because wine is a journey and not a sprint. That's all I got to say. All right, so, final thought, Jackie? I actually didn't know there was a word for what my people do. My people come from, from islands. Your food choices were what you could pull out of the ground, pull off a tree, or, or pull out of the ocean. I come come to find out as an adult that's called a pescatarian. Uh, <laughs> and 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 to be clear, like my dad was Muslim, so pork was a no-no in our house. But I think it's important that people understand vegetarianism and veganism, that's a choice, and you need to understand that there's privilege in your choice. There are people who are where they are, who eat what they can eat because that's what's available to them. And whatever yeah. keeps them and sustains them, like I get to choose. And that's a privilege. Not everyone has that choice. Hey, Amen, yeah. brother. Very well said. Um, we had a lot of great questions. Um, so I, I implore everyone watching to connect with everyone here offline. Everyone's handles are on the screen currently. And just want to thank you guys for being here with me and in community. Um, so amazing. I want to hand it back to Melandra from the Beard Foundation um, to close us out. But thank you all so much. Thank you, Cassandra. Very nicely done. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank nice you so much. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. On behalf of the James Beard Foundation, we thank you for this enlightening conversation. Um, Cassandra, thank you so much. Our speakers, thank you very, very much. And of course, to our audience who stayed with us, even though we went a little bit over time, we truly appreciate all the feedback that you have provided us. Um, as we continue our Black History Month, uh, programming. Please tune in tomorrow and next Thursday for our Instagram live storytelling series. Uh, we have Amber Mayfield um, tomorrow and then the following week we have Zoe Ajanio. And we also invite you to attend our mental health webinar which is on February 24th. Thank you all so much and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank Bye you. everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks Don't a lot. Italy, for real. Thank you. No, Jackie, I just sent you all my personal information. So you got me, baby. I'm going to send it to everybody else. So you guys can always reach out to me. Okay. I love it. It is a deal. Real. Ribs. <laughs> Ribs, baby. Ribs. <laughs> and we come with the we come with for chicken gizzard for you, Eric, for real. Oh, we're coming for the chicken gizzards. I am coming for the chicken gizzards. Like literally, I have it down. I'm gonna ask him what like batter he used, my salt and pepper, because I am like cannot wait for this. I am so excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I I I felt kind of good about those too. And my mother used to make chicken gizzards, and she would smother them the way you know, like the way you smother chicken. And and it was just what you're talking about. Like they were so. 
they were so tender so they had like kind of the texture of of beef stew but the flavor of chicken stew now miss valerie you know i'm in dc i'm two hours from you on amtrak i'm 215 in a car baby on 95 so if you if you want me to come i can i can bring some of this uh, back here now we can, I, I can do this. you know you know we might have we might have to come up with something because my i live with my sister the enophile like when um uh, like if i go out to dinner and i i'll, I'll take a bottle of wine and people say what is it i'm like i don't know lee bought it it's on the rack and, no. and, lee, and, and when i get home lee will say at least look at the label so you can tell me what you took and i'm like it was good so but but peep this the government of barbados reached out to me recently and they want me to build a distillery in barbados so i can bring sorrel home so wow. this time, yeah, we are wow. going to be in Barbados on the beach drinking Sorrel. You know what you oh, need? You need to you need to Sorrel at the Barbados Food and Wine Festival. I remember going to that festival yeah. probably eight or nine years ago and was like, okay, how am I media?